Brian, uh, congratulations on what really is one of the more exciting breakthroughs in the last number of years with SMA. It's, uh, it really is very impressive. You know, w with the breakthrough, with work of your nature, I'm sure it comes a fair amount of attention and almost pressure. I know I, I wrote uh, an opinion piece on, on your, your lovely work, and I'm getting emails on a daily basis asking uh, from SMA families, how has it been for you? Has there been a lot of attention and even a lot of uh, some pressure? Well, thank you, yeah. Alex. I indeed, we are very excited about these results uh, because they, they really have, have shifted right. the, the way that we think about uh, spinal muscular atrophy. And, and many uh, parents and, and family have, uh, have paid attention to our work yes. on, on just the gene delivery and then our, the results that we had when, when actually it was tested, when we tested in, in the mouse model of spinal muscular mm -hmm. atrophy. Indeed, we have been uh, inundated? contacted and in, in inundated with, with a sense of uh, urgency from families, uh, as, as well as a sense of congratulations yeah. for paying attention mm -hmm. to the disease. And that, that has actually given us more energy and, and has even pushed us further on, on the necessity of how many people are truly affected by this disease and that uh, we need to continue marching mm -hmm. down our lines uh, to do hard work uh, to continue to advance our studies right. and, and our understanding of the disease. So, so now having really shown that you can essentially rescue severe uh, spinal muscular atrophy in a genetically faithful mouse model, uh, uh, even after birth, which was a question for some, showing A, that you can do that, and B, that the same sort of cellular specificity exists in, in non-human primates. What do you see as the next important steps and, and what kind of timeline? I know a lot of people want it tomorrow, and I'm sure it can't be that fast, but how do you see it unfolding from here on in? So of course, with any of these breakthrough yes. therapies, uh, we want this to be in, in patients as soon as possible. Uh, we have been encouraged by how our drug, how our therapy, gene therapy, has truly translated from a mouse to a non-human primate. Uh, and, and that certainly pushes us closer mm -hmm. towards actually translating towards the clinic. As, as far as a timeline, uh, we have a, a milestone-driven plan mm -hmm. uh, to move a, the translational program from, from truly a bench-side project mm -hmm. to the bedside project, mm -hmm. uh, and that is actually treating patients. Now, we have a rigorous timeline, but our ultimate first goal is to be safe, Yes, and that is these are experimental therapeutics uh, being tested and we need to do in our own minds that this is going to be a safe mm -hmm. uh, development uh, safe delivery uh, and safe for the for the children and adults that it may treat uh, however there are also regulatory uh, driven projects that one has to perform and those are dictated by the Food and Drug Administration and certainly there's a two-way street upon uh, basic researchers and translationalists uh, such as our group mm -hmm. working together with the Food and Drug Administration to devise the proper studies to actually move forward to the clinic in, in the most rapid and then secondly, the, the, in, yeah. primarily the safe manner for patients. Has FDA approved the so-called SCAAV for any other disorders yet? Uh, and if so, what diseases are out in front of you sort of blazing a trail, or are you it? So uh, AAV vectors mm -hmm. in general have, have been tested in thousands of human patients. Uh, to date, there have been no studies in spinal muscular atrophy, to mm -hmm. our knowledge, that has utilized uh, gene, gene delivery. Right. As far as self-complementary vectors, these are new, uh, mm -hmm. new vectors that have a, a new technologies that have been recently developed in the field right. that is starting to gain momentum uh, on the clinical landscape. So uh, lying in bed, uh, staring at the ceiling at three in the morning, is there something that, that troubles you, that worries you about the path forward? Uh, is there one hurdle in particular? It's, it, it's a, a long and fairly arduous path, but are, are there things in particular that you might uh, 
think are going to cause problems as you move towards the, uh, the bedside. So I think our, our studies, and, and certainly mm -hmm. we do lie awake at 3 a.m., and yes. sometimes we're working at 3 a.m. <laughs> uh, on, on these projects. Um, the, the ultimate uh, issues are to design a safe, mm -hmm. a well-controlled, and the right patient population for mm -hmm. the first clinical trial. Yeah. Uh, what we are trying to do, uh, collaborating with clinicians, neurologists, mm -hmm. as, as well as in, with what we need to uh, do in our ultimate discussions with the Food and Drug Administration, is to define the patient population that is the right population to do the first trial in, mm -hmm. in, in man right. uh, or, or in person. Right. And with that, uh, you, there's certainly not a one-shot approach, but these trials are a large amount of money, uh, and we want to design the trials in the first trials to ultimately gain success that will open the floodgates to mm -hmm. move into uh, other patient populations of uh, SMA patients. Right. That is type ones versus type twos versus type threes, yeah. who are the initial patient population that you perform the first clinical trials that is predominantly evaluating for safety. Right. But you're trying to evaluate for, uh, pre, uh, for uh, clinical efficacy. And so, got to ask this, uh, once again, probably not a, a welcome question. Stars in alignment, we're talking five years, uh, we're talking within the decade, what's your best guess? Uh, we have a rigorous uh, developmental timeline mm -hmm. to uh, translate, to move into the clinic, and we're talking several years okay. here to collect the, the data that we believe that the Food and Drug Administration mm -hmm. will uh, will allow us to move forward uh, mm -hmm. to start treating the first patients. So it's not a five year, it's not a 10 year. Mm -hmm. uh, to get uh, first into person, first into SMA mm -hmm. uh, individuals, uh, we are approaching the timeline to, uh, to start speaking to the Food and Drug Administration to help guide those formal studies mm -hmm. so that we don't have to turn around and repeat things uh, and, and do it right the first time. We try to keep uh, the, uh, the various uh, organizations involved mm -hmm. in spinal muscular atrophy up to date, and we are very happy to share our information with Fight SMA upon our uh, translation towards the clinic as well as our research-based studies. Uh, so we hope to give further updates. Uh, and what has Fight SMA meant to you in your research? Well, first, I'd, I'd like to thank uh, Fight SMA uh, for first uh, being the organization that truly brought me into the spinal muscular atrophy field mm -hmm. uh, through the annual meetings where I could learn from experts you, you such come as and yourself. Say, we can, I can do this better. <laughs> no, well, it's uh, wonderful to, to bring you to that meeting. It was a, it was a wonderful coup on our part. Uh, so it's, it's been a collection of, of true experts mm -hmm. and then individuals who are driving uh, towards the field that are raising the crucial funds uh, for the meeting and to fund uh, crucial uh, research experiments. So with that, uh, I think we should all be quite grateful uh, towards uh, the Fight SMA and, and the family mm -hmm. and the researchers working very diligently uh, on this disease that I think we truly are making a difference. Thanks, Brian. Get back to work. Thank you. <laughs> okay.